All right. Well, this is a certainly a different way to celebrate Easter this morning. Uh, I've never done this before and a outdoor service at Easter, much less a drive-in service at Easter. Uh, but so glad to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here. So we celebrate the Lord. Uh, let's do a little responsive thing. Often in our church tradition, many churches do this, but often uh, somebody will say he is risen and others say he is risen indeed. Uh, but just one time, we don't want to wake all the neighbors. Uh, but one time, when I say he is risen, I actually want you to honk your horn. Just one brief honk for a minute. Uh, so let's try that. Just one brief honk for a minute. He is risen, and your response is? Excellent. It could be a lot of fun to do that a lot more often if your kids are in the car, but the neighbors would not appreciate that. So let's, uh, let's be good neighbors this morning. But thanks for uh, encouraging me with the fact that he is risen indeed. I wonder if you've heard any of the following statements. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Little guys can do big things. Nothing is impossible with faith. Run at your giant and attack it, and you can slay it. But leave it alone, and it will mock you forever. While some of those statements could find some support from the story of David and Goliath, that's not the focus of that text. So this morning, we're going to walk through the text from 1 Samuel chapter 17 from David and Goliath. You say, wait a minute, I thought this was Easter. Well, it is Easter. And every story in the Bible is ultimately culminated in the Easter story. But this morning, I want to walk through the text of 1 Samuel 17 for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to walk through and make some observations on the way that it applies specifically to a greater giant slayer that we see here at Easter. So this is an Easter message in both the fact that it's from the Bible, but also in the way that we're going to get around to it at the very end. Now, for those of you watching in the car, watching online, those that haven't been with us in previous weeks, our church is doing a series this year, walking through the pages of Scripture, walking through the whole Bible in the year. And as we do so, I'm preaching through the Bible. We've asked our people to read through the Bible in a year, and many are doing so. I'm preaching through the Bible in a year. And also, our Bible study classes are studying it in a year. And if you're new with us, we'd invite you to join us in that task. If you want to see where it's at, there's a Bible reading plan on our website. It's right on our homepage, fbcspringfield.org. And there you can find the Bible reading, 2020 Bible reading plan. You can also find ways on our COVID-19 page to be a part of a Zoom-based Bible study that are even some of those happening even this evening on Sunday evening. But for what you need to know right now from the pages of Scripture that we've walked through for the last couple of weeks, the people of God are the nation of Israel at this point. They were being mocked. They were being terrorized by their enemies. And we're going to walk through this story in the pages of 1 Samuel 17. I want to see the story first in light of the original context. What could and should have the original audience understood when this was written nearly 3,000 years ago? Three shifting perspectives there from the story from 3,000 years ago, and then one perspective that we should have today, particularly on Easter. So the first perspective from 1 Samuel chapter 17 is the perspective of one who was conquered by fear of a giant. I'm going to read from the text. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits. By the way, that's about nine feet, about nine feet tall. That's about where my head is off of the uh, concrete right now in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. All right, his armor weighed about 125 pounds. He had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam or about as thick as the base of a bat or the head of a baseball bat. His spear weighed 600 shekels of iron, so a spear with the head weighing 15 pounds, give or take. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul, the king of Israel, 
And all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Beginning of the chapter it opens with some geographical details, how, how they're on one side of the mountain and the others on the other, opposing forces. This going on for 40 days, then being terrified by a giant. When Goliath would come out, they'd see his monstrous size. They would see he wasn't so skinny that he had to dance around in the shower to get wet or hide under, could hide underneath a power line when it was raining. No, this was a guy that was massive, with scale-like armor, incredible strength, and huge weapons. This is the stuff of movies. This is the stuff little boys dream about. But unfortunately, the Israelite soldiers were dreaming about it too. Not because they wanted to be the giant, but because they were dreaming of terrified, being terrified by being beaten by the giant. He would come out morning and evening, day by day, ridiculing them and the people of God. The giant was terribly effective. And the people were terrified. And King Saul and the men were dismayed and greatly afraid. The giant didn't need to slay them. He'd already conquered them and held them captive by fear. Shifting perspective, skipping down to verse 20, we're going to see the perspective of one who would conquer the giant by faith. And David arose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the provisions and left as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper and the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And he talked with them. And behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Along comes David. His dad had sent him there to check on his brothers, to bring back some news about them. And he was just going about his ordinary business, obeying his father when he hears these words. Then the perspective shifts again, verse 24 and 25, to the one who should have slain the giant, but the one who forgot about faith. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. They were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. He will give him his daughter and make his house, father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for this man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine and that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse was 26. So, verse 24 and 25, though, the men are fleeing. They say, Why? Why? What should we do? The one who should have slain the giants is what I'm talking about. Not the men, though. Well, why do I say that? Because the one that should have slain the giant was the king, King Saul. Because it was the king who had been selected previously in 1 Samuel chapter 9 because he was head and shoulders above the other Israelites. It was the king that was supposed to go out before them according to 1 Samuel 8.20 to go before them and lead them in battles. But here, he doesn't respond in faith. Instead, he thinks that bribery will get someone else to do his dangerous and dirty work. And then the perspective shifted to David. David notes the reproach that had been brought upon God's people. He notes that he is taunting the army, not just an ordinary army, but the army of the living God. David looked through the lens of faith and saw that this man that opposed the armies of the God who lives. It was said just a couple of chapters early in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that God doesn't look at height, he looks at the heart. And David knew that about God. He knew that the God that lived more than mattered more than this other dude. He knew that the God whose name is above all names is more important than this other unnamed, this unnamed Philistine. He doesn't discuss the guy's size, mention his weapons. He just compares him to God. This isn't the story of little David versus big Goliath. For David, this is actually the story of little Goliath versus great big God. The perspective shifts again in verse 27 to the one who was conquered by fear of the giant. The people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, David's oldest brother, when he heard, spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down? Oh, with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, the evil of your heart. You've come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned and moved from him and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him as again before. 
David's older brother is conquered by fear, and the, so are the rest of the people. Perspective shifts again in verse 31. When the people, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So David finally creates enough of a stir. The word gets to the king. He goes to the king and says, hey, the people have had enough. I'll be your servant. I'll take care of this and serve. Something that Saul should have said, but he didn't. Verse 33, perspective on Saul as the king. Again, the one who should have slain the giant, but who forgot about faith. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth. He's been a man of war since his youth. Saul responded earlier by bribery, but now he resorts to experience. He says, listen, you don't have enough experience. You're too young for God to use you in this way. You're too inexperienced. He calculates it on his own, and he recognizes that on his own, that David doesn't stand before the giant. Instead of responding by faith, as he, the leader that should have slain the giant, he forgot about faith. Perspective shifts back to David, the one who would conquer the giant in verse 34. Saying this, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father when there came a lion or bear. When there came a lion or bear and took a lamb from his flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to him, Go, and the Lord be with you. David is the one with this perspective of faith. He says that my God is big. He will help me. He stood by me in the past, and he stands with me in the present. Saul, in verse 38, is convinced now. So he says, may God be with you, but then he does something. He orders David clothed with his armor. He put on a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. Saul says, yeah, let's hope God's with you, but just in case God doesn't help you, here, take some armor. Have a weapon, too. Well, you may not have experience. Here's all our best technology, David. Just in case God doesn't help you, here's the best that we can do with it, too. Saul forgets about faith, and he hedges his bets, and he doesn't go all in on God. So let's see what happens with David. Verse 39. David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. I have not tested them. So he took them off. David tries them on, and he ultimately says, I'm not used to this. I haven't tested these. So he goes with what had been faithful in the past. He goes with the Lord. He was going to operate in dependence and trust in the big story of Scripture, in this little story of his life. So David, in verse 40, took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. He gets the stones. He brings his staff. He's going to blindly, it appears, rush in to face the heavyweight champion of the world with a stick and a few stones. And that's exactly what the Goliath thinks in verse 41 through 44, where it says this, the Philistine moved forward to him came near to him and with his shield bearer in front of him, not only him, but his own shield bearer. The Philistine looked and saw David. He disdained him, for he was a youth. He was ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine came to David and said, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Then David said, Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Goliath looks at him, his shield bearer with him, and he finally sees David and says, Ah, a teenager, a pretty boy, baby face, can't even grow a beard teenager. To make it worse, David, you don't even have a good weapon. Are you really going to hurt me with a stick? And in my imagination for a minute, if we just pause there for a second, I've got to think that David might have been starting to second guess his plan. If he ever was going to second guess it, now was the time. When he, rushing at him with some stones, and a stick sees a nine-foot-tall giant coming at him. 
But then he heard it. He heard the words that he needed to hear, the words that echoed into his own heart when Goliath curses David by his gods, by the gods of the Philistines, and says he'll kill him. At this point, I have to wonder if David remembered what he'd been told previously about what happened and was recorded in 1 Samuel 5 when those same gods of the Philistines had been brought the ark of God, symbolizing God's presence, and had God's ark put into a shrine to those same Philistine gods, only to wake up the next morning and to see their god Dagon fallen over, having lost its head before the symbol of the living God. Or maybe at that point, David remembered back to Genesis 12:3 when God made a promise to Abraham to give him a land, a nation, a name, and to bless those that bless him, and to curse those that curse Abraham's descendants. At this point, if you've been reading through the pages of Scripture, you should know that Goliath messed up in a way that he shouldn't mess up. He defied and cursed God and his people. So now David, with great bravery in verse 45, responds, and he says this, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the bodies of the dead of the host of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this assembly may know the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David doesn't come at him and say, listen, I'm so strong. He says, no, let me tell you about our God. Let me tell you how he is a giant slaying God. And with that, verse 48, the battle commences. The Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling with a stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. So he ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. With that, the battle occurs, the thwack of the stone on the head and then then Goliath, just like his false Philistine god Dagon, falls on his face and head off. David did not win the battle in his own strength or a generic faith in himself or just a faith in faith. But with a faith in a God who had proved himself time after time after time. David doesn't say to him in his final words, me and my little self is going to slay you. So this isn't a passage that we need to look at and say, based on my own faith and myself, I can do anything. This isn't a passage that tells us that we can use this story to do whatever we want if we just attack our own giants. No, this is a story that points to God and his defense of his name and furtherance of his purpose. Lastly, the perspective that we should begin to have, the perspective of those who conquer by faith in the giant slayer. Those who conquer by faith in the giant slayer. Notice what concludes this passage. The men of Israel, now the ones that had been terrified, now have faith in the giant slayer God. The men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout. They pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shurim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered the camp. David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, and put his armor in the tent. We end this passage with the people of God now having faith in the giant slayer. God the giant slayer as they now pursue the enemy that previously terrified them. For being real, the tendency is for us to read this passage and to think of ourselves as David. Trying to be the character and trying to be the hero. And there's many admirable things about the life of David. In fact, we're going to talk about a few more of them next week when we stream online only. David's a good character in this case, but not so much in two weeks later. Now, this story isn't really about David the hero, but Jesus the hero. One scholar points out that David and Goliath ultimately points us to the true giant slayer, Jesus. The one who slayed our greatest giant, the greatest giant ever, death as a consequence of sin. Which brings us to the perspective we need to have here on Easter. 
the perspective of one who conquers by faith in the giant slayer. Because though Goliath was a big giant, he couldn't kill everyone. And he was going to die on his own. But since the fall in the garden, man has been defeated and conquered by sin until Christ. Until Jesus, the greater giant slayer, the great giant slayer, fought with the greater giant, the giant of sin and eternal separation from God, the giant of spiritual death. And Jesus conquered it in an unusual way. And that's why this church is here. That's why we're gathering in the parking lot right now. That's why some of you are watching online. Because 2,000 years after the time of Christ, we look back at when he conquered the greatest giant. Jesus conquered a giant more terrifying than Goliath. So we don't worship David. We worship Jesus. David had learned from being a shepherd. David the shepherd had put his life on the line and his life had been spared previously. But Jesus the good shepherd sacrificed his life for his sheep. David went into battle and emerged immediately victorious. And he used the enemy's terrifying weapon to bring about the victory. But when Jesus went into battle, he died and stayed in the grave for a few days. But then Jesus rose from the grave, taking the enemy's greatest weapon and using it when he came back to life, taking away the sting of death. Jesus died for our sins that we might not die for our sins. And Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, which I know isn't something that happens all the time. And if you're listening and wondering, do Christians really believe that Jesus rose from the dead? The answer is yes, we do. And I know that that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, Jesus is the only one to rise from the dead and not die again. But there's lots of reasons why we believe that. And I can preach them at you right now, but I'd rather dialogue with you about them. I'd rather discuss with you over a cup of coffee on Zoom, of course, or some other platform. So I'd encourage you, if you really want to know why we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, send me an email. We'll interact. We'll schedule a time for a phone conversation. My email is jason at fbcspringfield.org or you can call the church during the week. I'd love to dialogue with you about that because there's tremendous evidence both inside the Bible and outside the Bible that Jesus died and rose from the dead and that's what we celebrate here at Easter. Today on the pinnacle of the Christian calendar, we don't celebrate David slaying Goliath. We celebrate Jesus conquering a greater giant, the consequences of eternal death. Because when Jesus fought on a different hill a thousand years later after David, he died the type of death we all deserve to die. The death for our sins, our sins of unbelief, our sins of fear instead of faith, our sins of doing, saying, and thinking things that are against what God commands. Some today would deny that God exists. But listen, just denying that God doesn't exist isn't any different than when my children were toddlers and we would play hide and seek and they would stand in the room and they would cover their eyes like this and they would say, you can't see me because they couldn't see me. Listen, covering our eyes to God's existence doesn't make him not exist. Just because you can't see him or he doesn't do what you want him to do doesn't mean he doesn't exist. So let's not mock God by denying his existence. But others, like Goliath, have stood and mocked God, not by denying existence, but by trying to make our own rescue plan. We have mocked his goodness, his perfection, and his holiness by pretending as if we can be good enough to get to him on our own, by pretending we can do enough good to cancel out the bad. We have mocked the sacrifice he made in our place on the cross. You see, if there was any other way for us to be rescued, God wouldn't sent, would not have sent his son to die on the cross for us. But the cross is not pointless. An empty cross and an empty tomb is not an empty promise. You see, the cross is empty because Christ's death has paid our debt. And the tomb is empty 
because Jesus, in his power, by God's power, is risen from the dead. The sign that shows that our sins are paid and that there is a secure hope of eternal life. Listen, the band's going to come back up. They're going to lead us in another song. And when they do so, it's a time for us to respond. It's a time for us to respond in faith, not fear. It's a time for us to respond by putting our faith in the giant slayer. Because unless God intervenes and comes and makes all things well, all of us in this parking lot and watching online at some point are going to die. Probably not because of COVID-19. Possibly, but probably not. But possibly. But the victory of Christ over sin brings us hope. It brings us hope in what happens after life. It brings us promise, the promise of his presence in this life. It brings us purpose. You see, Jesus, the great giant slayer, through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, he's paid the penalty that we are all due. And some of you, whether in the cars watching right now, watching online, live or later, are going to need to run into God by faith. By faith in Him to take the payment for your sins. To take the payment that you deserve and to trust in Him by faith. Some of you don't need to be conquered by your own fear anymore your fear of what happens after this life, but can instead can trust in Him by faith. I'm going to invite you in an unusual invitation in a way I've never done before. For those of you watching right now in the parking lot, if you would say, hey, I need to trust in Jesus as my Savior. I need to talk or pray with a pastor. Listen, we're not going to come with you and sit with you in the car. But in a minute, I'm going to invite you, when I step down from the stage and the band begins to play, to just turn on your hazard lights if you need to talk or pray with somebody. To take that bold step of obedience, just as David ran out in front of others, to turn on that lights and say, listen, I need to talk or pray with somebody. And I'll walk up to your door. My mic's going to be dead. Another pastor will walk up to your window. We'll talk right there with your window cracked. Or we'll, we'll even just get your phone number and give you a call if you're more comfortable that way. To talk with you about you surrendering to the God who conquered sin and death, placing your faith in the giant slayer, placing your faith in Him this morning on Easter. We're going to respond through song. I'll be in the parking lot just walking around, and if you need to talk or pray with somebody, just turn on your flashers, and I'll be out there in a moment or two. Or if you're watching online, shoot me an email or give the church a phone call during the week. And we'd love to interact with you about the most important decision you could ever make.